This is Lecture 3C, talking about population samples and probability. We've had a little bit of an introduction to these concepts earlier, and so we'll repeat some of those concepts and expand on them in this chapter. So up until this point, we've been working with descriptive statistics. These statistics we've used to describe data. We describe the distribution, the frequency, mean, median, mode, standard deviation, all of it just pertaining to a specific sample of data that we have. So we use a sample of a population and we've used all the scores in that data, all of the raw data or actual scores are available and we've used them to just show what the data tell us about the people who responded to our survey or provided the data. We're going to begin now to work with inferential statistics. This is what we'll work with for the remainder of the semester, and this is different from what we have been doing with descriptive stats. So in inferential statistics, we use information from a sample or a subset of individuals from a population, and we use that information to infer something about the population. This kind of statistics relies on probabilities, which are just like the odds that you, you think about when you're gambling. What are the odds of winning at a machine? That's what we're doing with inferential statistics. We produce conclusions that state a finding with a 5% or 1% chance of error. So consider this problem. Administrators at Diné College are interested in knowing how happy the Diné College students are with Zoom-based classes, and so this administrator developed a survey. Can he get every student at Diné College to take the survey? And the answer is no, that would probably not be possible. Some of the students will be located out of internet range or far away. Some will be traveling and won't see the email. Some won't be interested. Some are taking a semester off. Some never check their email. It's not going to happen. He can't get every student. So next he thinks, should he just send the survey by email and get the information from whoever responds? Well, this is a very common way of gathering data but it doesn't allow us to do any inferential statistics. It's convenient, but you would only have information from those students who may be already pretty good online, who are attending classes, who check email. In other words, you're getting a biased sample. Next, maybe he thinks, okay, maybe I'll just ask a few professors that are agreeable and ask them to give the survey to their classes. Once again, that's also convenient, but you only get information from those who happen to enroll in those particular classes. So once again, you're getting a biased sample. So the best way would be to put the name of every student currently registered at Diné College into a hat and randomly select students from the hat. Then once all of the whatever number of students he wants are selected, he should follow up again and again and again with those same students until they respond to his survey. Maybe he would even end up paying them to respond to the survey and he doesn't want to substitute in other students because then we're having bias introduced again. Doing it that way would be a random sample obtained by random selection, and that would be the best way to ensure representation of the greatest diversity of views. So this is an illustration you likely have seen before. It describes a population and a sample. And you can see the population is the group of interest, and the sample is much smaller. So let's start with the population. A population is everyone belonging to the group of interest. So note this word, everyone belonging to the group of interest. So if the group of interest is Diné College students, then it is all Diné College students that we're interested in. Everyone, all. If we're interested in something about women with children, then the population, and this is a formal term, the population includes all women with children. 
as we know, we can't get information from everyone. It's not possible. And we don't want to have bias. So we randomly select from this population using a method like putting the names in a hat, and we draw a sample. And so, for example, each of these were maybe randomly chosen to participate in the sample, and then we have data from these individuals that represent the population. An example, if the population is DC college students, we might choose a sample of 100 college students. If the population is women with children, we might select a sample of 50 such women. So in other words, we have a population which is all members of a group of interest. And from that population, we draw at random a sample. And from that sample, we can generate some information. We can get some descriptive statistics like histogram, frequency charts. We can even calculate the mean, median, mode. All of these are descriptive statistics that only pertain to our sample. They do not pertain to the population. We can't know anything. We can't draw any conclusions about the population from descriptive statistics. We have to have inferential statistics in order to be able to infer to or generalize to a population. And that means that we can take information from our sample and using statistical methods, we can infer something we want to know about our population. It relies on random sampling if we're going to draw these conclusions. So information about the sample alone doesn't allow us to infer to the population. For that, we have to have certain conditions in place, and that is what we're learning from this point on when we talk about inferential whoops, statistics. So we have some terms along the way. We talk about population parameters, and that just means the boundaries of the population, or we might say the mean and standard deviation for a set of scores in that population. They are inferred from large samples, so we usually cannot get every member of the population, so we infer using large samples. And population parameters, and this is quite important because this is a new language, are represented in Greek letters. So when we're thinking about all members of a population, we use two particular terms. We use this little symbol, which I usually write like that, as a lowercase sigma representing the standard deviation of a population. And we use this symbol, mu, which I usually write like this, to represent the mean of a population. What this means is usually there's been a lot, a lot of data gathered over a long, long time, and they tend to have mean and standard deviation that are approximately equal to the given values. We couldn't go back and get all of the raw data that contributed to it anymore, and so we're up we know that though over lots of samples, this is what the mean and standard deviation are, and that's why we use these Greek symbols. We then talk about sample statistics, and these are the data that literally represent the sample, like the mean, median, standard deviation, and the number in the sample, number of individuals. And the symbols you've already worked with, they're just letters that we're familiar with for mean, and standard deviation, referring to the sample, where we know every single data point, we continue to use M for mean and SD for standard deviation. This is a little video that I'll post for you to watch on your own time. 
So random selection is the gold standard. Every name is put into a hat and has an equal chance of being drawn. We know that the sample should resemble the population if it is randomly selected. More often, we use something that in your textbook they call haphazard selection. In other places, we call this convenience samples. And these take advantage of people um, or utilize data, we could say, utilize data from people who are available in the moment. So for example, we gave the email survey as one example of this. We send an email to a big listserv and we take information from those who respond. This is a non-representative sample because we have a different type of person who didn't respond. We could have a Facebook survey. We could ask your friends and they might ask their friends. That would be snowball sampling. But think about the biases that exist. Are your friends and your friends' friends in some way different from the population in general? I think we would conclude that this would be a biased sample. Professor asks her morning psych class students to participate in a study. This is unethical and also biased. It's unethical because the students might feel obligated to participate even if they didn't really want to, and it's also biased. Maybe it is, prefers morning, morning people as opposed to night owls. Maybe it uh, selects people who attend class over those who don't attend class or who take classes online. So again, this is biased. So random selection is really the only way to get away from these kinds of biases. So in inferential statistics, we're relying on probabilities and we do this all the time. Like you all know the answer to the question, what are the odds that a coin flip will result in heads? We, you all know the answer, what are the chances that it will rain today? Or how likely is it that the cattle will be on the road when I'm driving to work today? We do these little estimates in our, in our heads all the time and make decisions based on those little estimates. Bring a raincoat, take a different route. We use coin flips because we know the chances of heads or tails are equal. We look at the sky and forecast and decide whether to bring rain gear. We review past experience and decide whether to leave early for work. Inferential statistics are the same. We calculate the odds of generating a similar result again in the population and then decide whether our intervention or treatment or hypothesis is sound or worthwhile. So here's a quote. There's an excellent chance that if we use this treatment again in another group, it will be effective. That's what our conclusions in inferential statistics can tell us. Or, it's highly likely that this outcome can be attributed to the medicine. Or, this treatment is not likely to be effective in the population. In order to make claims about what might happen in the population, we set very high standards like 95% certainty or even 99% certainty in some disciplines. We want to be very sure that our conclusions are accurate. So how does probability work? Probability is the expected relative frequency of a particular outcome. And all we mean by that, looking right here, is expected relative frequency, what we expect if we conduct an experiment, such as flip a coin many, many times. The outcome just refers to the, the range of possibilities if we conduct the experiment. So this will be more clear when we look at these examples. If we use a coin toss, then we have outcome one, heads, we'll call it O1, and outcome two, we'll call it O2, tails. That's it, there are two possible, two possible outcomes. In the dice roll, outcome one is one, outcome two is two, we could get a three, we could get a four, we could get a five, we could get a six. So there are six possible outcomes. If we're wondering what the odds are of drawing a particular suit from a deck of cards, 
then we could have outcome one, hearts, spades, diamonds, clubs, four possible outcomes. Or if we're looking to see what are the odds of drawing a particular number from a deck of cards, we know we could get ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, 13 possible outcomes. So that's what we mean by outcome. When we calculate probability, used as the lowercase p, possible successful outcomes over all possible outcomes. So for example, when we flip a coin, I think I have that coming up next, the possible successful outcomes, maybe this person calls heads, that's one possible successful outcome, heads, out of all possible outcomes, which is two heads or tails, so there's a 50% chance of getting heads. In a coin toss, there's only one side of the coin with heads, so the numerator equals one, there are two possible outcomes, heads or tails, so denominator is two. One over two is one half is 50%. So probability is one out of two is 0.5 is 50%. What are the odds of rolling five or six with one dice? Well, there is one five and one six, so there are two successful, possible successful outcomes. And there are six possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the denominator is six. So we calculate the probability, two divided by six is one divided by three is 0.33 is 33%. So the odds of rolling a five or a six with one dice are 33%, one and three. What are the odds of drawing a face card from a deck of cards? Well, there are 12 face cards Jack, queen, king of each suit, so the numerator is going to be 12. And there are 52 cards in all, so the denominator is 52. 12 out of 52 is the same as 3 out of 13, which is 0.23 or 23%. You have a 23% chance of drawing a face card from a deck of cards. So let's look at this example. So first of all, over on the right, we have figure A, which is church choir members. N equals 18 mean there were 18 members in the choir. And it looks like there are four who are aged 36 to 50. It looks like two who are aged 51 to 65. A lot of people who are in the 66 to 80 category and fewer who are in this 81 to 95 category and just one person who is older than 95 years old. So that's what we're dealing with. And here's the question. If the names of all the individuals in the choir in the figure A distribution were put into a hat and one was drawn at random, what is the probability that the age of that person will be 80 to 95 years old? So we can see this, we'll use the 81 to 95 category. And if we look at that, we can see that in that category, we have three people. We can follow this over and see three people in that category. We have 18 people total that's stated up here. And so we know that we're looking at three divided by 18 or one divided by six or 0.17 or 17%. The probability is 0.17, 17%. 0 .7, 17%. So now we have another example. We have figure A, that's the same figure from the previous slide where we had the church choir members, 18 people in the age distribution of these individuals. And figure B, we have the library visitors. And again, we have the age distribution. We have um, under five years old, five to 20, 21 to 35, and so forth, all the way up to greater than 95. And so let's look at this question. If the names of all the individuals in figure A and figure B were put into a hat and a 40-year-old's name was drawn, what are the odds that that person is a member of the choir? And we assume here that the person cannot be both a choir member and a library visitor. So assume that these two groups are independent, that none of the people who are choir members are also library visitors. So we know here that we have nine library visitors and four choir members in this 36 to 50 category, which includes our 40 year old. So in our choir, we have uh, these four people and here we have 
uh, these nine library visitors who are in that age category. So that's a total of 13 people um, in that category. And nine divided by 13 is 60.69 or 69%. So the probability of the 40 year old being a member of the choir is 69%. So that's kind of how we work with probability. So in summary, descriptive statistics give us information about the individuals in the sample, but inferential statistics allow us to generalize back to the population of interest. Populations are all the possible members of a subgroup of interest, and samples are small subsets of the population. Random sampling is the only way to be able to infer to a population. All other sampling methods produce bias. Inferential statistics allow us to generalize to a population going beyond the descriptive stats that describe the sample. Population parameters are represented by Greek letters with lowercase mu referring to a population mean and lowercase sigma referring to the population standard deviation. And the symbol for mu looks like this, kind of a weak example, and the lowercase sigma looks like that. And that is the conclusion of this week's content. Uh, and we'll have just an example of how we compare distribution still coming up.